our outline for today. Uh, I, we're going to do a little bit of rearrangement of the seating just a little bit. Here's the new rule that I want to do, and that is uh, I want the, le the back two rows uh, on the right side, on the left side, and in the two center sections. Uh, move yourself out of there. All right. So I move up to the front. I want you to prepare your eye clickers. And for those of you that are uh, just using it for the first time, uh, aren't you going to ask me about this on my nose? No. You're not? Too? Yes. What's on your nose? Uh, my TA just asked me about my nose, and I had a nose transplant over the, you know, between classes. So now I can detect pizza at two miles. Actually, I just had a wart removed, so <laughs> but that's a little bit, that's a little bit uh, more interesting explanation. Anyways, go ahead. Uh, press the power button and hold it um, until it flashes, and then type in DD. Now, you don't have to do this every time. If you use it, your clicker for this class only, you only have to do it once because we're going to stay on frequency DD. Uh, I don't want you in the back two rows. Move forward. All right? I don't want to have to keep saying that. Seats down here. Yeah, there's seats down here. Just be sociable. Move up to the, the front, please. Good. Front, please. Seats up here. Try to make, and you can make a new friend, you know, sit next to somebody you don't know. No, you may not sit there. The last two rows must be empty. I just told you that. All right. So there should be enough seats for everybody. All right. No. Okay, good. 
Um, anyway, so you'll get the go nitro message and then it'll say ready. And then, um, uh, and then you'll be able to click. Now I have a question for you and this is kind of a, a mental IQ test related to the reading on uh, chapter two. Here's question number one. This is multiple choice. Um, go ahead and answer. Okay. 20 seconds to vote. Ten seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. T minus five and holding. Get your answer in. We got two hundred students. That's good. Four, three, two, one. Zip. Uh, yeah, the correct answer here is spherical dome. Uh, and we're, we're actually going to be talking about that today. It's called the celestial sphere. If you think about the entire sky, you know, which we can't really see, um, you know, you know, we're on earth, so we can't see the stuff that's below our feet, but anywhere you stand on earth, you'll, you'll, if, if, if the, you know, like if you're out by the shore or you're out in a big field, you'll see almost 180 degrees of the sky, wherever you are. Um, and so we call that the celestial sphere, and uh, we're going to actually work out. Now, uh, for those of you that are wondering, this fig figure, make a note of it. It's uh, figure three in chapter 2.1, uh, which is what we're going to be talking about to start today. And as I've mentioned before, please come down uh, to the front nine rows, please. Uh, as I mentioned before, front nine rows. Yeah. seats over here. Yeah, there's seats over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, I try to uh, give you guys a cue, um, which we've got right here, figure three, chapter 2.1, um, so that you can figure out kind of what part of the textbook I'm talking about at any particular moment. Now, I don't have one on every slide, but I try to get it on many slides and, and kind of help you out and give you a little bit of uh, guidance on that. This is the famous um, observatory in Chile called La Silla. Some excellent telescopes up there. Here's a picture of it on the map. Uh, it's kind of south and a little bit east of us uh, up there in the mountains of Chile, which the reason that they like it down there is they're really high. So they're above the at a lot of the atmosphere, and uh, the air is really dry. It's in a desert. If you ever go to, you can't really tell it from here, but um, if you look at other pictures uh, during the day of La Silla and the other observatories, first nine rows, please, not in the back two. First nine rows, please, not in the back row. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, if you ever look at the uh, the pictures of La Silla, it, it 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 looks like a desert up there. So that's why they do it. Dry air is easy to like what we have right now. If you go, was anybody out last night? Any anybody do see any good constellations? We're going to be talking about constellations today. It's, it's one of my favorite topics. One of the first things I I ever learned when I was a you know my big brother was in Boy Scouts and I was a shrimpy third grader. And uh, he taught me my first constellations. Never forget it. Uh, so we'll do some more clicking ahead. I want to um, talk about, and just in review, the stuff that we um, discussed last time. For those of you that may have missed it, we'll just do a little run through. We had a sentence formation task with eye clickers. We, we typed in a bunch of sentences. Uh, and one of them, this was a popular one, actually. I, I looked at all of them. Uh, experiments determine scientific laws. That is lovely, okay? Um, and it's, it's actually a sentence without having to um, make any adjustments or spelling changes or anything. 
uh, QPHA. And we'll be doing that um, from time to time in lecture and occasionally on exams and stuff. So uh, that's what we worked on yesterday, clicking wise. Uh, we talked about the moon and the earth to scale. And there's a, a figure in the textbook about that. Uh, uh, we looked at uh, earth and moon for Mars. We talked about that. And we worked in the idea of an eclipse and why there was no eclipse. Um, and what we looked at was actually astronomy picture of the day. And I want to draw your attention to this astronomy picture of the day. We're actually going to talk about that. Uh, we also talked about interstellar dust and molecules on uh, the fact that we can see the quantum fingerprints when we look at starlight or light from the, you know, the various nebula uh, or even light from this comet. You can see up there, bring this down to 50 percent, a, a little bit darker. OK, um, you can see up here. Let's see, where's my, here we go. Uh, right up here is that's a comet and that blue color tells us something and matter of fact uh, we'll talk about them in a second but somebody had a question uh, yeah go ahead I just wanted to ask a quick question about the eye clickers yeah if you're doing like the, the question we did before do you have to click send when you when you're in multiple choice which we were uh, you just have to click a b c or d and it goes straight because it's only looking for one click and you can change it. You know, if you voted for A and you want to change it to B, you can do that Any t until I close the question. You know, like I do a countdown and then I go zip zap. Um, uh, so it'll always record your, the first thing you type in and then the very last thing. So if you send seven things, it'll remember the first thing and then the seventh thing. Uh, first nine rows, please. Not in the back two rows. Not in the back two rows. Not in the back two rows. Yeah, there's seats up here in the front. Yeah. Uh, we'll, I, will, I'll, I won't have to yell at you guys too much more. Maybe one or two more lectures. Uh, so, yeah, that's what it, so, uh, but we're going to be doing another click, uh, couple cl clicker questions here. You're going to have to hit the refresh key because then we're going to be in short answer again. Um, but anyways, let's take a look at this picture. Look at that picture. This is from Astronomy Picture of the Day for today. APOD, Astronomy Picture of the Day. Um, this is what we call the Hyades Cluster. And, it, and in the foreground, you know, the stars are way far away, light years away. These are about, let's see, I wrote it down here. They're about 151 light years away, most of them, in this cluster. But that comet is in our solar system in the upper left. So this is kind of a cool photo where you, you get a bunch of cool things. The Hyades cluster uh, and the comet uh, 2016 R2. And uh, my wonderful students, I want you to make a note of that uh, term, the Hyades cluster. It's, if you've ever heard of the Pleiades, it's near the Pleiades. Pleiades is another cluster of stars. And there's all kinds of clusters of stars. By the way, if you ever go to the um, observatory uh, for extra credit, uh, then um, you'll probably get a chance to look at several clusters of stars, maybe the Hyades, maybe the Pleiades, or some other cluster of stars. Kind of cool to look at. Uh, so this one, Hyades, the Hyades cluster is going to be important for us toward the end of the semester, about two thirds of the way through, because we're going to be able to um, look at the spectra and the brightness, the luminosity of the stars in the Hyades cluster and find a pattern in their luminosities and their colors, their surface temperature. Um, and from that pattern, deduce the approximate age of that cluster. We'll be able to tell when it was formed, how old it is, roughly, to a few million years, you know, which in astronomy is chicken feed. But it, so the Hyades clusters is one of the, one of the coolest clusters, and we can see it from Earth, and we can see this comet. Now, this is um, the comet C2016R2, 
pan stars. Um, and uh, this bright red star, uh, actually the, 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 um, the group Hyades is about five degrees of, five square degrees of stars. So it's a fairly big patch of the sky. All right, now this one down here, this bright one, go ahead and write this one down, Aldebaran. Uh, this is a red giant star, right? It's a little bit older, more advanced in age. Uh, and we're going to be talking about Aldebaran. And um, all this stuff here is in the constellation Taurus. Now we're going to be talking about that today. And so this is a nice thing. Sometimes the astronomy picture of the day can be really instructive that very day for us. Uh, so Aldebaran, and Aldebaran is the brightest star in Taurus. It's the Alpha star. We call it Taurus Alpha. Alpha Tauri. You know, like Alpha Centauri, the nearest star to Earth? Well, Alpha Tauri is also known as Alde. And it's an Arabic term, and I believe it means the follower in Arabic. You know, a lot of the stars, you know, we, you know, a lot of people have named the stars and stuff in the constellations. And a lot of the uh, Arabic names seem to have stuck over the years. And this is one of them. It's kind of cool. Question? Which um, constellation are those stars in? They're in the constellation Taurus. Okay. And when you look at uh, Orion tonight and then look a little bit above overhead of Orion, you'll see Taurus and you'll see Aldebaran. It's going to be clear as a bell tonight. All right. So if you can get out out, uh, you know, maybe at the edge of town or, or just, you know what, you know what might be pretty good is up on top of the Libra garage for just stargazing, okay? You'll be able to see Aldebaran and it'll look red, okay, in the constellation Taurus. Um, so, now, uh, side note, you can add this to your notes. That constellate, that comet, the tail of the comet looks blue. And that is because it has carbon monoxide in the tail. It's ionized carbon monoxide molecules. Yeah, it's not like, you know, it's smog from Los Angeles that went up into a comet or something. But, it, you know, just Mother Nature sometimes makes CO, lots of CO2 and lots of carbon monoxide, a carbon and an oxygen bound together. Uh, and this one, when we look at that blue and put it through a spectrograph, looking at the spectrum and measuring it, graphing it, uh, we, we recognize the quantum fingerprints of carbon monoxide. So it's kind of cool. And it's fluorescing. You know, the sunlight is activating it and it fluoresces. Um, another side note, the Hyades cluster is about 150 light years, 151 light years away. And, but Aldebaran is a little bit closer. And it's, it's, Aldebaran is not in the cluster. It looks like it is, but it's, it's uh, about 65 light years. So a little bit closer. The cluster is out there at 151 light years, and Aldebaran is about 65. So it's fairly close to Earth. That's why it's so bright. Um, now, this is a quote right up here. You might want to jot it down. We're going to go to the document camera in a second uh, and work out the implications of this. On January 12th, just a few days ago, comet uh, C2016R2 was over 17 light minutes from planet Earth and nearly 24 light minutes from the SUN. Right, so go ahead and write that down in your notes. We're going to do some calculations and some careful sketching here in a minute based on that set of uh, measurements. And uh, I want you to add to that quote that the astronomical unit, the distance from Earth to the SUN is 500 light seconds, all right? So what we're going to do is convert these distances 
They have light minutes, and we're going to convert it into, lights, uh, into uh, light seconds, and then we're going to convert that into astronomical units, and then we're going to graph it up. So um, let's go to the document camera. All right, can you turn the lights on now? And what we're going to do is work out this set of proportions on the document camera. And I have something special that I'm going to do uh, with you, and that is use a smart camera. Now let me get my cursor back over here. Rest of these specs. All right. So we're recording again. Now, I, I told you, you guys saw my diagram on the, with the smart, uh, the smart, uh, the smart pen, and it was kind of shaky looking. I hope you guys did better. But this is going to be perfect. I did this very carefully. So, and here's the, here in the upper right now, I don't have 17 minutes and, and 24 minutes. I have 2.04 AUs, 2.88 AUs, all right? All right, and in the center of the screen, go to 50%, please. 50% auxiliary power. All right, in the center here uh, is Earth's orbit. And at the intersection of those three, uh, those, those two green dashed lines is the SUN. Now watch this, here it comes. I'm burning it in with flames, right? So there's the sun. Now, you, all you have to do is watch this or maybe adjust your picture accordingly. Now, I put Earth over here. Okay, that's the sun. Here's Earth, this blue circle, blue dot. All right, and here's the letter E for Earth. All right, now, the first circle I'm going to put in is 2.04 AUs. Now, I measured it out really carefully. All right, this one is, uh, let's see, it's 408 uh, pixels for the, um, for the radius. Here it is, centered on Earth. And see how I said this one, the second one, it's a little bit past this far right point on Earth's orbit, okay? Now, I didn't do that on my sketch. Um, but I did do it here, and you can actually see that they're, they don't overlap completely. Because it's 2.04, not 2. If it was 2.00 exactly, it would hit that point uh, on the right, but it's a little bit past there. And then over here is 2.04. Everywhere on this circle, make a note of it, everywhere on this blue dashed circle is 2.04 AUs. 17 light minutes from our planet at this time, okay, at this instant of its orbit, all right? Now, um, the second one is 2.88 AUs, so this one's 576, I think, units across, all right? And here it is, there's the intersection point, okay, this one's green, and this one's centered on the SUN, so you can see just like mine, you, they cross each other uh, here and then also down here, all right? And so when you're looking at this thing from Earth, you're actually looking along this line of sight up to this crossing point, simultaneously 2.04 from Earth and 2.88 from the Sun. Or you might be looking down at this one, all right? Now, if this is all you know, then you can't decide between the two. But we have one more thing um, to help us. And that is, we know that this is January. And the, the constellation that we're looking at is at night. And it's the constellation Taurus, all right? So let's look at the night side. This is the night side of the Earth. Here's Earth. Here's the sun. So everything on the other side 
is, you know, that's night. You're looking out. You know, so if you're standing on the surface of, of the sun at midnight, you're looking straight out this way to the left. All right, so that's the night side. Here's the day side. Because if you're on this side of the earth, on the right side of this little blue dot, then uh, you're looking up at the beautiful sun. All right, so that's the... Now, go ahead and make a note of that on your sketch. Day side is on the right, left side is the night side. And my wonderful students, that alone and thinking about constellations, the months of the year, the signs of the zodiac, allows you to figure out that this is the actual position of the comet relative to Earth, at least on January 12th. All right. Now we're going to go through that by looking at um, section 2.1. So let's talk about uh, section 2.1. Okay. And this is um, figure five from section 2.1. And it's, it's a chart of the signs of the zodiac. Um, and inside that, you can see the Earth's orbit. So this is like a, this is like a, it's not an overhead view like the one that we just looked at, that we made. This one's kind of looking at it in perspective. So you're above and off to the right. Uh, it's kind, and it's kind of an idealized picture. As the months go by and we look at the sun from different places in our orbit, we see it projected against different places in our orbit and thus against different stars in the background. So right now, what's the January? What's the sign, the constellation zodiac sign for January? Virgo? Aquarius? Well, what is it today? Capricorn. Capricorn. Okay, so right now, um, if you were able to blot out the sun and see all the stars behind, you, you know, during the day you can't see it. When the sun is up, it's so bright, it washes out all the stars. But if you could, you know, like, um, you know, uh, blot out the light from the sun, get up above the atmosphere and put a, a big round circle where the sun is, you'd see the constellation Capricorn, right? Isn't that what you just said? Yeah, all right. All right, and that's, I don't know which one, that's this one right here. All right, now, Taurus is over here. All right. So you can work it out to, to yourself that, um, that the uh, this is where we are right now. We're looking, this is the day side. This is the night side of the earth. And kind of at a slant over here is Taurus. So January 12th, they were looking up over here. Anyways, um, uh, the sun blazes out all the other stars during the day. So you can't really see it. So you have to think six months in advance or six months behind, you know. So, so right now at night, you can look uh, up at, you know, the sky at midnight and see, you know, whatever is opposite Capricorn. So whatever is opposite Capricorn um, is, so it's Capricorn here. So uh, Cancer and Le uh, I guess a little bit of Leo. All right, and then off to the sides is Taurus. You can still see that night. So that's what that picture was. You know, they were, you know, if they looked straight overhead, they would see Cancer, uh, maybe Gemini, but a little bit to the side of that is uh, Taurus. So that's how this, the zodiac, uh, the signs of the zodiac uh, works. And we actually split it up into constellations. Um, here it is again, this is figure five. And the word zodiac comes from the fact that uh, most of the objects, you know, the fanciful objects we attribute to these shapes, you know, okay, that's Taurus the bull or uh, that's Leo the lion. You know, the most of them are animals, Zio for uh, living animals. And then uh, uh, they, use, they use the Greek word idion uh, for symbol or image um, to in indicate that these are the animals the animal symbols that are on the, uh, the ecliptic. 
All right. Now, I want you, we're, we're going to talk some more about the star maps, the constellations and stuff. But I want to do some more um, IQ test questions with you. These ones are by way of being a survey. So what we're going to do um, is short answer. Okay. Um, and every answer that you type for the next two questions will be graded correct. All right. So just give me your best um, answer, whether it's whatever it is. All right. Uh, do you know the constellation Orion, A or B? Go ahead and vote. And if you don't, it's fine. It'll be great. Go ahead and grade those correct. All right. And hit the send key when you're done. This is a short answer. This is a less survey type question. So it's looking for any symbol that you send, but I only want you to send A or B. Okay, so type an A and then hit the send key or a B and hit the send key. All right, and how many we got here? Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All right, now uh, go ahead and show this. All right, so most of you apparently know Orion, which is great. It's a lovely constellation. Uh, go back to the computer display, please, laptop. Now, let's try another one. Um, next question. Do you, do you know the Big Dipper or do you not know the Big Dipper? And there's a, a diagram of it up there. So type in an A, type in a B, either one. No, not AA. Type in one uh, A. And hit the send key. Better. No, there's no C's. You can't look if you're if you're if you're typing in a C, you're screwing yourself up. You're not going to get a correct answer. So if you just typed in C, good. I change it to an A or a B. All right. And for those somebody in here typed in A A. That's a fat finger error. It typed it in twice. Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, 85% uh, of you know uh, the Big Dipper, so that's really nice. So let's go over some of these constellations. And I'm going to uh, point out a couple things that you may not know about each of these constellations, uh, starting with Orion. Uh, Orion is a winter constellation, and it's up after supper. All right, so if you eat your supper, and then you go find a place where there's not too many, too many uh, UCF lights or city lights or Disney lights, uh, you'll be able to see it. Um, the, the most uh, distinguishing feature is the three stars in his belt. Um, the sword that hangs from the belt is actually a huge nebula uh, of young stars and swirling interstellar dust and gas uh, from which new stars are forming. Uh, Betelgeuse is the star on Orion's right shoulder. So this is the left side of the diagram, but if you ask... Mr. Orion, the hunter, he would say, yeah, that's my right shoulder. All right. Also, when you're looking at it in Florida, he looks sideways when he comes up over the eastern horizon. It's like he's climbing up the edge of the world. I love to, I love to see Orion rising. It's just it's always cool, especially here in Florida. Uh, Bellatrix, that's the left shoulder. Okay, so that's this one over here. His left shoulder, right side of your view. Rigel, down here, the right knee. Uh, and there's a few more uh, interesting stars. And this is one of the reasons that Orion is, is a really good one for Astronomy 2002 to know. Uh, because there's it, if you know that, you can look near to it and find a bunch of other stars and constellations 
that we will be talking about. Matter of fact, we're going to be talking about Betelgeuse a lot because it's a red giant. It's actually a super giant. Sirius, below and to the left. All right, and I'll show you what it would look like in the sky here in a second. Uh, Sirius, that's the brightest star in the sky. And guess what? Sirius is actually a binary star system. It's Sirius A, the brightest star in our sky, and Sirius B, which is a very small uh, white dwarf star. Uh, constellation Taurus. What? I found something on the web for speech is very small white dwarf star. Take a look. I just acted. I didn't ask Siri for that. Siri, just hush. Gosh. That's the first time that ever happened to me in lecture. Cool. Uh, anyways, uh, if you find Orion, then constellation Taurus is above him. And that's a region of the sky. And then the Pleiades cluster is kind of above. It's in Taurus, but it's kind of above a little bit further. Okay. Uh, and the Pleiades cluster is really, really uh, easy to see under even poor uh, lighting conditions, poor viewing conditions. And uh, so it comes up uh, late in the summer, late at night. You know, like just before dawn in the summer. Uh, and uh, uh, it comes up uh, late at night in the fall, but right after supper in the winter. Okay, so here's what it looks like. All right, go ahead to zero. Uh, actually, go to 25%. All right, that's better. Okay. Okay, so here's the three stars in the belt right here. Here's the sword, and that's actually a big uh, nebula of stars. Betelgeuse, the right shoulder. Uh, here's the diagram to kind of help you with it. Um, and then here's Betelgeuse up here. All right. And then uh, Bellatrix, that's down here. Okay. And Bellatrix is kind of bluish. And you'll be able to tell the colors of these things, definitely. Okay. Uh, and then Rigel down here, the left knee. And then guess what else we've got nearby? Mr. Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. That's over here. There we go. That's Sirius. And so if you can find Orion and then look a little bit down to the left below his feet, um, that's, uh, let's see, it's Canis Major Alpha, Alpha Canis Major. It's in the, in other words, it's in the Canis Major constellation. It's not in the Orion constellation. And it's the brightest star. Is that right? It's Canis Major. Uh, I just always look, I look for Orion and um, I just, then I look for Sirius. Yes. Yeah, right. You follow the, these three stars in the belt point fairly close to the left. Not exactly, but fairly close. Right. And constellation Taurus is above that. Uh, and it's off the, this. It's not on this picture, but you go out tonight, you'll see it. Go out after supper, and uh, it's you know, a lot of beautiful things to see. All right now, let's talk about the Big Dipper. Okay, the Big Dipper is up near the North Pole Star, the Polaris, the Pole Star, the North Star. And it's close enough to it that you can see it any month of the year if the conditions are good. Um, so we call it an all-year constellation, the Big Dipper. That's why it's nice to know, because if you're ever trying to uh, head north, you just head for the Big Dipper, and you'll be roughly heading north. And with the Big Dipper, you can find the North Star because the last two stars in the cup of the Big Dipper point to the North Star, all right? Now, it turns sometimes, like in this diagram, the cup is holding water, but I know um, in summer, the cup is emptying water uh, out. And I just love seeing the Big Dipper. It's just, you know, you see it. I spent a lot of years living up in Montana, 
which is another state where they have these things called mountains, uh, which are these big rock pots. Um, you know, for those of you from Florida, that's there are these things called mountains. And oh my goodness, you go up in the mountains, and in Montana, if there's no forest fires and stuff, it's always clear, and you can always see just pure as a clear as a bell. Uh, the Big Dipper, another kind of interesting fact, and you'll probably view this uh, if you go to the observatory this semester, several binary star systems, although they look to the naked eye like um, single stars, when we actually point a telescope, and not a very fancy telescope, uh, you can resolve some of them as actually two stars that are orbiting each other. And there's actually... Um, one of them, I can't remember exactly which, is actually four, two binary star systems that are orbiting each other. So it's a, it's a quadruple star system. It's kind of cool. Summer constellation. Now, six months from now, when you're on summer vacation, you'll be able to see Cygnus the Swan. And this is a good one, uh, also known as the Northern Cross, although I learned it as the Swan. There, and, and if you're from England, uh, what do they call the Big Dipper over there? I think they call it the plow. Uh, and if you're over in Europe, they, they have various, you know, German words for the plow. Uh, I've also heard it called the wagon. Um, and so anyway, so Cygnus uh, is Latin for swan, and that's the way I learned it. So the star Albireo, if you look on the, the end of this one to the right, Albireo is this one. Um, and I know last semester at the observatory, they were definitely looking at this one because uh, there's a lot of cool features to it. These are the two wings. This one going up, this one going down. And then here's Deneb, that's like the tail of the swan. Now, here's the thing that I want you to jot this down. I don't think it's in my notes. Cygnus the swan is flying through the Milky Way. So if you can make out Cygnus the Swan, you're looking at the Milky Way as well. It's flying in the direction of the Milky Way. It's flying towards Sagittarius. That's cool. Your mic is on. My okay. mic is on? Well, no, that's not the mic. Yeah, this is good, thanks. Now, another thing I want to point out, there's an X-ray emitting black hole called Cygnus X1 right about here. Okay, now you can't see it because it's a black hole, but we can see uh, that black hole causing an orbit of a blue giant star near it. Uh, and so we can base, we can study what that blue star is doing and figure out the mass of the black hole. Uh, so it's kind of cool, and I'll be showing you th this week and next week uh, how we do that. Now, nearby uh, Cygnus, it's not in the Cygnus constellation, it's actually in a different constellation, but it's in this picture, uh, and it's a good star to know, is the, is the star Vega. Uh, and Vega um, is uh, helpful for us because it's easy to see. And we actually use it as a, kind of a benchmark for astronomical brightness of stars. It's like the center of our brightness rating system. Uh, in other words, we compare all stars to the brightness of Vega. And it's kind of a blue, bluish white star. If you've ever seen that movie Contact with Jodie Foster and stuff where she, she's... Her dad is like an extraterrestrial or something like that. And she's listening to transmitters from... You know, there's a lot of hokey stuff about uh, that, that movie because it's Hollywood and stuff. But there's a lot of cool stuff in it. And uh, Vega, you know, there's definitely a star. Uh, and it's fairly close to Earth. It's fairly bright. Uh, and I don't know if there's any space aliens that their dad is Jody Foster's dad. But uh, anyways, uh, it's still a cool movie to watch. All right, now, um, about this thing, this term constellation, and this is a quote from uh, chapter two. We use the term constellation to mean one of 88 sectors in the sky. So it's not just the zodiac, 
you know, Capricorn, Aquarius, Gemini, Taurus, all that stuff. Uh, we, we've actually done that as kind of a map of the entire celestial sphere, all right? Uh, just like we divide up the map of the United States into states, our nation is a, a nation of states. So here's a bunch out west. And they're kind of rectangular in size. And um, here's, here's a picture of Cygnus, the map of Cygnus. And you can see that it's, it's kind of rectangular um, shaped. And it's irregular shape. And you can see on this one, here's another one. This is the constellation Andromeda. And, it, you know, it just looks like you know, a bunch of rectangles, but they're, they're not quite rectangles because they're, they're oriented to the, the celestial sphere. So they're a little bit narrower at the north end than they are at the south end, which you can see in this diagram. Um, so when we say that something is in Taurus, if we say that something is in Andromeda, if we say that something is in Hercules, if we say that something is in Cygnus, you know, Alpha Cygni, Alpha Tauri, Beta Centauri, the second brightest star in the constellation Centaur, Centaurus. It's in the southern, southern sky. It means that it's in one of these kind of patchwork divisions of the sky that we've set up uh, from 88 constellations. You know, so Ursa Major is in there. You know, and I don't have Ursa Major here, but it's, uh, it's fairly close to this one. Cassiopeia, Perseus. And Cassiopeia and Perseus and Andromeda are, are stars, uh, are constellations that you can see in the summer uh, really well. And I remember the first time I looked at uh, Andromeda, I took a star map and sat at the end of a dock on a lake up in Maine with a really pretty girl that I was friends with and we looked at stars and this is the thing that I was trying to get her to see I still don't know to this day if she actually saw it but I did and that is M31 so go ahead and write down that word M31 M31 is the designation of something um Here's a close-up of it, M31. It is a nebula. It is a, and the old-fashioned name for it, uh, you know, from over 100 years ago, uh, would have been the Great Spiral Nebula in Andromeda. It is a galaxy, M31. It is the closest spiral galaxy to us. Our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is orbiting... Andromeda galaxy. Andromeda is orbiting our galaxy. We're, we're in a, uh, a mutual gravitational interaction. All right. And supposedly we're going to smash into each other in like a billion years or some, some ungodly number of years. Uh, but yeah, the Great Spiral Nebula. So when I say in Andromeda, it's that patch of sky with the kind of, kind of rectangular edges and stuff. All right. Um, now, here's a picture of the teapot. And see what, they, see what it, it says there in the middle of it? Sagittarius. And here's the, here, you know, that's, it looks like a teapot. It's supposed to be an archer, Sagittarius. It's a man with a, a bow and an arrow. But uh, I guess somebody in England said, oh, let's have a spot of tea. And they call it, started calling it the teapot. So a lot of people call it the teapot. Here's what the, the map segment, the state of Sagittarius looks like on the map of the celestial sphere. Now, the teapot is important for us. It's something that you can see easily in the, go up to 50%. It's something that you can easily see in the summer in the southern sky. So if you're out on a clear night, you're camping out or something up in Ocala National Forest or wherever you happen to be, hopefully you're out west at some point in your life. In the summer, you look to the south, you'll be able to see uh, the teapot Sagittarius. And that is important for us because um, when you look at the teapot, 
Look in the constellation Sagittarius. Yeah, you can do that. Um, you are looking at the very center of the Milky Way galaxy. And at the very center is this um, famous black hole, Sagittarius A star, that we are going to be studying in Black Holes Week. And actually, it's constantly on my mind because uh, a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about now, uh, Kepler's laws of motion. Yeah, the reason that we measure this elliptical orbit of a star around the, the black hole is because of what Kepler found. And that's in the constellation. This one is in the constellation Teapot. Or what did I say? The constellation Teapot. The constellation Sagittarius, also known as the Teapot. So let's talk about Copernicus. Uh, Copernicus. This is the end of chapter two. Uh, and he became famous in the West for working out the heliocentric model of the solar. In other words, in the olden days, you know, like Aristotle and stuff, they believed that the Earth was the center of the solar system. And uh, is, is Sarah Goldman in here? Sarah Goldman, are you here? Sarah Goldman? Okay, cut that. Uh, he was a priest in Poland. He was from Poland. He was a priest, also a medical doctor, kind of cool, which a lot of people were in those old, in, in the olden days. You know, they, you know, a medical doctor is not going to be very, in, in our day, is not going to be an expert on astronomy, but uh, Copernicus was. He published his, his famous book, De Revolution Omnibus, uh, at the end of his life. In fact, uh, apparently the legend goes that he, um, he okayed publication of it on his deathbed. Uh, he was kind of a humble guy. Um, calculated each planet's orbital period around the sun and its relative distance uh, from the sun in terms of the AU. So Copernicus, he didn't know how many meters, he didn't know how many light seconds, but he did know the AU, so that's what he worked with. You know, they could work that out. And here's uh, figure two from chapter 2.4, um, uh, which shows his diagram from his book. Uh, and it's all circles. Now here's a quote, and this is actually a pretty important quote for us. His ideas, Copernicus, although not widely accepted, until more than a century after his death were much discussed among scholars and ultimately had a profound influence on the course of world history. Now, not many people can claim, uh, make a claim like that, but Copernicus could. He could not prove that the earth revolves around the sun, um, uh, but he, in fact, the old system, the geocentric system of the ancient Greeks, what we call the Ptolemaic system, did just as good accounting for positions and stuff. But Copernicus felt, dude, that ancient Greek system is so complex. It's like the IRS tax code. And Copernicus was convinced that nature itself ought to be fairly simple. Now, when we come back on Tuesday, we'll talk about Copernicus a little bit more and Kepler. Uh, one more thing before you go. I'm going to give you a, home, a short homework assignment. It'll be ready by lunchtime tomorrow, due on Tuesday. So stay alert. You're dismissed. Lights 100%, please. Cursor return. Uh